prior to Simon's diagnosis, you say your life was perfect. In what way? Yeah, all I can think about right now is bin juice. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, it was. I, to sound cheesy about it, we were just really in love and um, everything was good. We had two young children. We were living in the countryside, being creative hippies. Uh, Simon was working on his, on his short films and I was planning to write. And we had a big big garden in the countryside and children running around so yeah, think, things, things were good and so the, the first signs that anything were wrong so stuff with what you described as sort of a floppy foot he said he's this floppy foot and you uh, to begin with you thought it was he was kind of sort of being a bit of a hypochondriac about it all yeah really concerned wife yeah I, I sort of dismissed it as no you're you know you're just it's, it's the clutch on your car your grand uh, we we had kids at the time so we were busy with that and uh, we, we really dismissed it and then he he began to have to go for tests and things like that but even at that stage it, motor neuron disease is, is is diagnosed in the absence of it being something else so it takes right. a long time to get to that diagnosis about six months of really horrible nerve tests and things okay. like that but he was 34 uh, very yeah. young yeah. when it was finally diagnosed mm. and gradually over time it began to consume his body I mean he was uh, he was bit by bit uh, he was losing the ability to do all the things that he loved to do yeah the the initial prognosis is three or four years to live but with Simon it, it, it actually progressed even quicker than that he was diagnosed in 2008 and by 2010 he'd gone into respiratory failure and ended up in hospital so I'd say about a year after the diagnosis he it, it progressed from his foot he, he couldn't walk anymore so he was in a wheelchair and uh, respiratory failure just happened much quicker than we would have we would have thought. And there's an interesting part of the story here, which is something that I don't think either of us no. knew this morning. That, it, mm. that in Ireland and the case by case, uh, I think uh, over here as well, um, that there is a the, the the decision is made not to um, assist someone who is in respiratory fa failure with motor neuron disease. Now he had pneumonia. And he was respirated and put on a ventilator, but the doctor actually said, if we'd known what it was, we, that, we wouldn't have done that. That was the, that, you know, we, well, we shouldn't have done that. Yeah, what they say in Ireland is it's not advocated. So it's a bit of a grey area. Um, and, and in saying that, a lot of people with MND wouldn't choose to be ventilated because once you're ventilated, the disease continues to progress and you lose function. Um, so it doesn't stop the disease. Mm. Um, ironically, it would have been what Simon would have wanted. He, it, it did happen by accident, but he, he was already... His sisters were looking into ventilation in America because we had young children and mm. Simon is very much... Uh, rage against the dying of the light, stay with my kids, yeah. be around for as long as possible. So he, but if he, he got hadn't what he wanted. Been really. Ventilated at that time um, by mistake yeah. um, to get him through his pneumonia, he wouldn't have gone on to do the extraordinary things that he's done, which is his his movie, writing his books. But I mean, what that has also enabled him to do is, is write treasure hunts for the kids. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a different style of parenting, but it's the parenting that he can do, and he still has that involvement with them. Yeah, Simon's amazing like that. He will always find a window in. All through the disease, he was like that. Once, if he lost something, and, and with MND, you're kind of grieving the loss of, of different body parts as they go, you know, the legs, the arms, the voice, uh, eating, all those things. You're, you're in a state of grief the whole way along and, and getting used to a new uh, reality and, a, 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 you know, it, it plateaus for a while and you get used to that and you grieve the loss of the things and you move on. And, and Simon would just constantly navigate that and find a way to connect with the kids and he never, ha he still hasn't have ever stopped doing that. And, and the children themselves, uh, you say you've learnt from them, you learn their, yeah. from their coping mechanisms, the way they deal with it. Um, uh, one of one of your children loves uh, the Mister Men. Yeah, well, the kids are great, you know, because they keep you in the moment. And I, genuinely, I have learned so much from them because they they just they, they have a real sense of this is just the way things are. And they, they my I think at a particular age they go through uh, the twins are five now, so they have that sense of uh, putting themselves in context with the rest of the world. So Hunter, my five year old, is reading Mr. Men books at the moment, and he says, "Yeah, my dad can't move, and other dads can, and there should be a Mr. Men called Mr. Can't Move for Dada." Right, so, right. You know, it's just so cute. Yeah, 